All right, I'd like to ask everybody to take a seat. We're going to get started in just a moment. Hi, I'm Jennifer Evans-Cowley. I am a professor in the City and Regional Planning Program here at Ohio State University and serve as the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs in the College of Engineering. And as we planned this conference, we realized that uh, there were a lot of possible intersections. And yesterday, I was really delighted when one of the, pre uh, the presenters talked about enterprise architecture and explained it as it's really just city planning. And so that's great. I was, I was happy to see the intersections across disciplines there. So the remainder of the afternoon is going to be focused on cities and how we think about big data in the context of cities. And I was also very pleased that um, Scott in our last session talked about little data and the notion of little data. So Sarah is going to be talking about uh, big data. And Sarah Williams is an assistant professor at MIT's School of Architecture and Planning. She's the director of the Civic Data Design Lab. And the Civic Data Design Lab works with data and maps and mobile technologies to develop interactive design and communication strategies that bring urban policy p issues to a broader audience. And after Sarah presents some of her work, we're going to hear from Nader Afsalan at the University of Colorado, where he's completing his PhD. He serves as the vice chair of the technology division of the American Planning Association. And his research is focused on the intersection of policy, technology, and participatory processes that support city planning. So in this session, we're going to talk about big and little data. And so Sarah's going to go ahead and get us started sharing some examples of how we can visualize complex information in easy to understand ways to help advance our community dialogue. So Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks. Hopefully you guys can hear me. So as Jen, Jennifer said, um, I run the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT. And what we do is work with data to expose urban patterns using designs that communicate. And to just give you example, one quick example of what I mean, this is a, a project that we worked on recently uh, in New York City's fashion district, uh, New York City's uh, garment district, which is uh, Leonard, centered in Midtown Manhattan, uh, has a kind of a, a $18 per square foot where they are right next to Times Square, could be getting four, 50 or $40, $40 uh, per square foot um, for the rental space. and. Uh, the city really wanted to rezone it. And the fashion designer said, no, this is really an important zone for us. We go to the garment center every day. It's still very integral to our work. Um, and so we tracked the fashion designers for two weeks um, to illustrate how they use the garment district. And you can see that they're all you know, merging into this center no matter where their offices or studios are. I'm not going to talk about this project, but it's one of uh, examples of how I use data to kind of communicate uh, economic policies within the city. Um, so what I want to talk to with you all about today is how we can be active with data to create policy change. And I think there's really four ways that we can do that. We can take government data sets and visualize them to show policy outcomes. We can use technology to collect new civic data where formal structures are not. We can take our data back from social media and reuse it to describe the places that we live. And we can create policies that allow us to use the mass amounts of privately collected data for a public good. Um, I'm going to focus on two areas uh, today. I would love to talk about all of them, but I think we have a limited time. So I'm going to talk about uh, using technology and also using social media to describe our cities. Um, so one project that I've been working on um, to use technology to collect new civic data where formal structures are not is a project in Kenya. And um, I don't know how many people are familiar uh, with uh, African cities, but mobile technology has really leapfrogged in those cities, and they use them for almost everything. Um, this is a cell phone showing M-Pesa system, which most Nairobi people use to get anything from a cup of coffee to get a bus ride or um, they basically send cell phone minutes for everything. And we really wanted to uh, leverage that technology to think about mobility in cities. And I've been working in Nairobi, I guess since you know 2004, I developed one of their first GIS databases. And that was really to deal with the issue of transport in the city. And it is extremely critical, um, the kind of, the, basically Nairobi comes to a standstill almost every day. It takes sometimes two or three hours to get into the city center. And um, the main 
way people get around are matatus. These are the matatu systems. And about 3.5 million people live in Nairobi, and the majority of them use these matatu vehicles to get into and out of the city. Um, they are the public transport. But the matatu system is extremely informal, and it's often hard to navigate. And this is actually an example of a, a matatu sign, uh, I guess it's artist. Um, and so basically to run a matatu, you just need to put a sign in your vehicle. <laughs> so it just kind of shows you the chaos of the system. And data on the matatu system is extremely hard to find. There is limited information about where matatus go. And um, I have been working on a transportation model in Nairobi, and we had no idea where the routes were um, for the system in, with about 40% of the vehicles on the roads being matatus. Um, this uh, had a serious effect on our model. Um, so we set out to think about how we could uh, collect some of this data. And the only data set that existed was this text file um, that tells us general information about where the matatus go. Um, but there's 130 routes. I think that we see that some of those are missing here. <laughs> um, and so what we did is set out to see how we can leverage the ubiquitous nature of cell phone use in Nairobi, Kenya to capture data about the informal transit system, which most citizens depend upon. Um, so what we did uh, was we created a cell phone app. We also used um, other mobile technology to collect uh, data. So we actually tested it with normal GPS units to see how well our cell phone was doing. Um, we developed a data set in GTFS format, um, which is the data standard that Google uses um, in Google Maps. So when you uh, find your transit um, in Columbus, you're actually using um, a data set that is driven from GTFS. Um, and um, what we hoped to do um, with this and, and, and have partially done since the release of this data is to really create change by allowing the data set to be openly available to engage the private sector community to build applications on top of it, to use it for transportation models, and but also to give the citizens open data set through a data visualization. Um, so we set about collecting the Matatu routes, and this is one of the first routes we collected. And one of the things that we did in the process is not just collect the standardized route, but here we collected designated versus undesignated stops. Um, the U is undesignated and D is designated. One of the biggest issues with the matatus, it's they stop wherever they please, causing um, some congestion of their own, as it were. Um, but that's also because the designated stops are not appropriately placed. So one of the things that we wanted to use the data set for is also thinking about better stop placement. Um, this is just a dump of the first data as it looked as a, in raw format in GIS. Um, and you can see that the system is highly complex. Um, and we translated that into a visualization. And this is actually the Nairobi Matatu map that we released in January with great success. Um, the citizens of Nairobi were extremely happy about it. Um, it went viral on Twitter, but most importantly, it created government buy-in. We had been engaging the government all along about the creation of this data set. Private developers understood the potential of it, but it wasn't until the government could see the data that they got really interested in partnering and working with us. And now uh, the map and the data set are official data sets for uh, the Nairobi city government on the Matatu system. Um, just to give you an example of what GTFS looks like, it's a very simple text file. And uh, the simplicity of the system allows um, it to be used um, in a number of different ways. And this gets into some of the conversations that we were talking about with open data standards. By creating it in a standard format, any technology that is already using this standard can uh, be implemented with it. So, uh, for example, Open Trip Analyst um, is an open source software that uses GTFS, and there's a number of different software products that are being currently developed for GTFS to do analysis and transportation models because so much of the transit data 
uh, is now in that system because it's a Google standard, uh, which uh, we could talk about why Google is setting standards another, at another uh, time. <laughs> um, but one of the things that it does is allow us to create an app like this um, uh, in Boston uh, where we can find out when our next bus is coming because the GTFS system has kind of schedule information. So we had actually a hackathon in Nairobi, um, and these are some uh, students at University of Nairobi building apps on top of the GTFS system. And two apps um, were produced out of this, something called Moth Reroute, which does routing on cell phones and smartphones, and then another app called Sonar. Um, and these are two now um, viable apps. Sonar became much more popular um, for doing routing in the city of Nairobi. And part of what they added to this is a crowdsourcing to uh, add corrections uh, to the data set, uh, but also to tell us about accidents on the routes or when Matatus change routes uh, along the road. Um, as I said, the map um, was uh, really a way to engage the government um, and that it did uh, go viral uh, when we released it. It was in all the newspapers. Um, and one of the things that's been really great is that uh, uh, the local newspapers have agreed to publish this uh, paper version so that citizens can have access to the map. Um, so if you don't have a cell phone or a smartphone, although a lot of Nairobi citizens do, you also have access to the data through these paper visualizations. We're working with Google right now, and we will be the first informal transit system in Google Maps, um, which I'm really excited about um, because it provides access uh, to an informal system that's really, really, in many ways, the formal uh, system. Um, so the other project I want to talk about is uh, taking our data back from social media and reusing it to describe the places we live. And social media, um, as you know, we say almost everything um, on it. We use it um, to shout out where we're going. Um, this image shows a, a, a corner in Brooklyn where we find out it's hipster apocalypse, but it's also John's Bath Cave. Also the best bagels in Brooklyn. So how do we use this kind of data to describe the city? Um, and so what I did is um, I took Foursquare, which is a, a social game. How many people know what Foursquare is? Oh, almost everybody. If you don't know, Foursquare is a urban game um, that allows you to become a mayor of a place. So if I went to Starbucks every day, I might become the mayor of Starbucks, and if I become the mayor, I might get a free coffee. Um, and so that's the kind of incentive to playing the game. You can also win badges, like being in MoMA the most amount of time, uh, so forth. But um, And we also uh, hacked into Facebook and got their data. Um, people check into Facebook in a, a different way. It's not an urban game. I think it's more to um, kind of expose that you're proud uh, that you went to a particular place. I find it to be used a lot more um, as kind of a tourist um, announcement that you were um, in a given location. So we set out to look at if we can get into the API of these two systems, what, can, what do they describe about the city? Um, and so what we did is in the APIs of both Foursquare and Facebook, if you send out a latitude and longitude point you can get data around that latitude and longitude point. So you can get all of the check-ins around that. So actually, you can see our first test, we sent these latitude and longitudes, and the data that came back was very close to the point. So we actually had to set up a much finer grid of latitude and longitude points, um, which required 30 different fake users requesting 5,000 points every hour. Um, and this is code that we developed for Foursquare. Um, the same thing was done for Facebook. We sent 140,000 different latitude and longitude points. We had to create four different apps. Each app had 100 different test users that we generated um, in order to uh, kind of trick the system and get all their, their data. I should tell you that I, we told, I told both of them that I would be doing this <laughs> beforehand, and they said go for it. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that because essentially – uh, they have a distributed database in which they hold the data. So to write the SQL query to give us the data was actually harder than us actually making these calls to the API. 
although they could have made our life a little bit easier than uh, submitting. We wrote the code in processing. Um, here is the ultimate points. You can see how close they are together. And here is a result of uh, four square check-ins in the city. And these are coded by um, yellow's food, um, purple's nightlife, green and parks. Um, and this is for four square. And then this is for Facebook. And one of the things that you can see instantly is that Foursquare has uh, kind of much more check-ins. And that's because the mundane things in life are considered part of your gain. Where uh, uh, in Facebook, I think people tend to just shout out when they're doing something more significantly oriented. Um, we did a number of different types of visualization strategies of the data. This is Foursquare, which so shows certain peaks at Union Square. Um, urban centers, um, Penn Station, of course. And then you see uh, the same uh, in Facebook, where Times Square and things like Yankee Stadium, um, Empire State Building are much more significant as a kind of tourist attraction. Um, we looked at the data along with other kinds of traditional data sets, medium income, median age, average land value. One of the things that we found um, that perhaps uh, both of them uh, corresponded with most was uh, office and retail space and land value. The higher the land value, the high, higher office usage, uh, the more check-ins. And that has to do with kind of the economic driver behind uh, both data sets. But I think one of the more interesting things about uh, the data is we did it for a number of cities is that it shows the urban morphology of the city. This is actually Tokyo. And you can see the land use pattern around, sorry, around Tokyo. Tokyo's uh, kind of driven by its uh, transport system and this nodal transport system. The blue are the transit agencies um, in uh, Tokyo or kind of the transit stops, subway stations. Um, here in Moscow, which was really surprising, Moscow had the most check-ins of all the cities that I looked in, so they're very digitally oriented. But also, one of the things that you notice are these blue mega malls. And this is kind of a new development pattern in Moscow to have more mega centers, and that's coming out in the data set. Um, Rio, um, you can see this uh, orange is a kind of more office and workspace versus the green and pink, which uh, speaks of the uh, beach culture in Ipanema versus the central business district. And um, here in Mexico City, and this is why I started to do uh, these various cities, is because I actually was doing cell phone research in Mexico City, and I had no land use data for the city. And these maps allowed me to get a general understanding of where is the business district, where is the nightlife, where are kind of different uh, residential activities within the city. Um, I'm going to go over about a minute. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's fine. OK. Um, one of the other really, really interesting things I think about social media data is it tells us about how we feel in the city. This is actually a zoom in on JFK uh, in New York City, which is the major airport. And um, you can see what people feel about JFK. The space between farewell and insanity is one of many of the interesting things that are said about being in the airport, as well as just across the street watching a drug deal go down. Uh, <laughs> um, also, hell seems to be centered uh, just north of Grand Central Station, so I'm not sure I would want to go into that area in New York City. Um, and so I think kind of how we describe uh, ourselves and our city on social media also becomes a kind of an interesting way that we can use social media to analyze place. So ultimately, I think one of the most important things we need to take from this is that we need to own the data we put out into the world and take it back and create meaning out of it that can be used um, to create different kinds of policy outcomes and change the way that we look at our cities. And I'm just going to leave uh, you with this video um, of, oops, of Mexico City. This is actually using cell phone data combined with some of the social media data that we had um, to look at transit patterns in Mexico City. Um, and then we combined that data with air quality measures uh, along the road network. Um, so the black is actually showing the transportation 
uh, using cell phone data as a proxy combined, combined with sensors that were along the roadways. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. So one of the things that both Sarah and um, Nader emphasize is that we actually have to go out and get data where it doesn't exist. And so uh, seeing the project in Nairobi, I think, is a great example of how we can use technology and blend that with volunteerism to capture and help build something really valuable. Okay, Nader. Thanks. So I'm going. Okay. So I'm going to focus on a single project that. Um, I've done with Jennifer, so thank you very much for your help, Jennifer, with that project as well, which focuses on how we can interpret big data for understanding disaster recovery process. So uh, we talked about mass participation of people through social media. We, talk, we, we, we talked about um, the fact that millions of people used Twitter in the disaster recovery process or during the disaster when disaster was happening. Uh, thousands of people joined Facebook groups uh, for disaster recovery processes. Hundreds of people were using Airbnb to offer uh, their housing uh, to people. But the whole idea is that who are really these people? Uh, who did all, uh, how did all this online activity turn into action? So I'm interested in uh, looking at the idea that how we can uh, look at big data and move from big data, data to little data to understand uh, people's behaviors in disaster recovery processes. So um, there are two questions here. Uh, one is that how can we identify the active online participants in the online communities that are arranged around uh, Hurricane Sandy, that are actually arranged after Hurricane Sandy, and who are really these active members? So there are two things here, how we can identify those active members and who are really there, what are they doing? So we looked at Facebook groups. We found 65 open groups, and 40, uh, 54 of them accepted our request to join them. And the total number of members in those focus, oops, sorry. And the total number of members in those uh, groups is 38,000. So we are trying to find those active members among these 38,000 people. It's interesting to see that uh, only 7% of these people were creating posts, which means that more than 90% of these people were kind of not doing anything uh, in, the, on, on, in the group. They were mostly pro probably just browsing or just looking at the post or maybe just creating some uh, likes. But the whole idea is that uh, more than 90% of these people were not really actively involved in uh, in the online environment. So uh, we did network analysis to identify these influential members based on their level of participation and actually based on how uh, their posts are being treated by other group members. So for example, how their posts that they are posting on the Facebook are attracting likes and comments from other group members. So uh, we, we used uh, I-5 index hits, so these are types of um, Network analysis indicators that we work with, we found 102 members out of these uh, 30, 38,000. So these are, these are those people that we found as influential members. And then we looked at how these people are really working together in the, in the online environment. So this graph that you're seeing here uh, shows that if, if you look at each one of these uh, big nodes here, these are the people that are influential in the network, and uh, the people that you see are around uh, this, this one are those uh, people that are interacting with that influential member. So uh, we visualize these networks, and this one you see uh, two, two main people who are very active and influential in the network. There are a couple of other people who are mediating the uh, process between these two. Uh, this is another network in which you see only uh, one people is very active and influential, which means that a lot of other people are making uh, likes and comments on the post that this 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 guy is creating. Uh, but not all of the member uh, all of the networks are that simple. Some of them are really complex, like this one, as you see. There are a lot of people 
interacting together. So the whole idea is that based on this, these types of visualizations, you can see how people are interacting in the online environment. Who is active, who is not active, what are those sub-communities in the network and how those communities and sub-communities in the group or network are working and interacting together. Okay, so we found all these groups and sub-communities and active members, but the question is that, so who is this guy here? Who, um, who is this person? Is he, is he only active in the online environment or he's also active in the, in, in the underground activity? Uh, can he or she help with the uh, recovery process as volunteer? Or uh, he or she is only active in the online environment, creating some buzzword, but n n doing nothing uh, on the ground. So we sent out a survey to all these selected members. One third of them accepted and participated in our research. And basically we asked about the background of these people, uh, who are they, what is their educational background. We also ask uh, about their volunteer activities and we also ask them if they were really active uh, regarding disaster recovery processes, Hurricane Sandy disaster recovery process. So the whole project is around groups that are created after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, as you see, about 42% of these people have bachelor's degree and 22% of them have graduate degrees, which means that around 64% of these active members have at least bachelor's degree or higher. About one third of them um, have professional degrees or experiences in working in professional field. About one third of them have uh, degrees or experiences related to managerial. And you see other people who are experienced in technical, sales, or craft and service workers. Uh, this is the map that we created based on the zip codes that they provided for us. And as you see, all of these people, except only one of them, um, at the time that disaster happened, was living in an area that was very highly affected or highly affected by, by hurricane. And the other, the other people who is not from here is living in New Orleans, so it would be interesting to see why he was very active in this process as well. In addition, most of these active members have backgrounds regarding uh, doing voluntary activity on the ground. Uh, it's, it's a, it was a general question that we asked them if you have a background of doing voluntary activity, and as you see, about 77% of them uh, were saying that they, they've had background in community service or social issues. More than half of them have background of doing voluntary activity regarding youth service and education. But what about their online and under, underground activities? So, so far what we covered was focused on uh, their background. What was their education? Uh, what was their experience of working as volunteers? Right now we are going to look at what were, what, what were they really doing in the online environment and on the ground regarding Hurricane Sandy. So in terms of their activity in the Facebook group, uh, we asked them what, uh, what, was, what were you really doing? And as you see, 25% of them were active to, to just inform group members about recovery news. They were also active to just read about recovery-related news, organizing events or gatherings, informing group members about possible resources or facilitating communication between the group members and an and, and outside organization, which in most cases is the local government, or some other issues like raising money or requesting for assistance. But it's also interesting uh, to see that about 45% of these people were active regarding other things rather than only uh, hurricane, hurricane recovery issues. So they had some informal social interaction with their peers or other group members, and w which means that they are, they are making friendships, they are they are active for recovery related issues to inform and the things that we just saw here, but they are also active for other social interactions as well. 
In terms of their activity with local governments and other organizations, about 60% of them were saying that they were actively working with a local government or other type of organization for specifically for Hurricane Sandy recovery to gain information from those organizations or report issues to those organizations or facilitate interaction or dialogue with those organizations or between organizations and the citizens. And more than half of them believe that this type of interaction that they've had with the city uh, had direct effect on the recovery process. But as you see, about 40% of these people did not have, did not have on the ground activity, which means that about 40% of them were only active in the online environment. And the reason was that, for example, for this one, this person was saying that, I believe that I would have been more involved on a volunteer basis if the timing has been different. As, I, as it was, I was homeless for a time and finally relocated in late November. So this person was, was homeless, but he was still actively working in the online environment, but he was, he was not able to be actively working on the ground, which means that he was not able to probably work with the local government for disaster recovery or, or helping with different, uh, different recovery processes that are going outside of the online environment. Or this person uh, is saying that being a parent of two young children prevents me from being able to do a lot of underground activity at this time. We also asked about their willingness to volunteer five hours a week to assist in recovery efforts. And as you see, uh, more than half of these people were interested in, uh, in, helping with, in helping the government with the recovery effort but there was a slight difference between those who were interested in doing this online and offline. But, but the difference is not that high. So it was like 60, 67% for those people who were interested in doing this online and about 55% for those who were interested in helping the government as volunteers on the ground. So as a summary, uh, it's great to it's great to tweet and say that we need, we need donation or just inform your peers about something that is happening at the recovery process or at the time that, recover, uh, at the time that hurricane is happening. But the whole idea is that we need to get people on the ground and really do the work. So we need, we need, to, we need to think of really effective ways for harnessing strong public interest in an event and turn that into real action. So the whole idea is that a lot of these people were active on the ground as well, and a lot of these people have had the background and qualifications to work as volunteers or even to work as professional liaisons between the city and citizens. However, we still have a couple of people who are not uh, who probably do not have that qualification. So part of our argument is that we need to use mixed method for interpreting big data and moving from big data to little data to understand people's, people's behavior in the online environment and to understand uh, people's behavior and interaction in recovery processes. Thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and open it up for questions, but I'll start with one. So in both cases, you were able to engage with volunteers and um, get them to participate in these processes. What did you find most challenging about uh, trying to get engagement? So, can you start? Yeah, go, you go first, yeah. Um, so it's, it's a complicated process um, for different reasons. Um, people are anonymous in these groups and they don't know who you are, you don't know them in most cases. So for example, in my case, I'm originally from Iran and it was a Facebook research, so I have a lot of Iranian friends on Facebook as well. So at the time that I was posting the survey link on Facebook, a lot of people were just, not a lot of, but there were a couple of people who were hesitating by participating in the survey because 
they were not really know who is this guy, why, what is his real intention, why he's doing this. So, so, so that was part of it. And, and it's interesting to see that a lot of people are um, doing online research to learn about your I identity. So there were a couple of people who were searching my name online or looking at uh, my online activities or my website, but it's still they were not really convinced. A lot of, I mean, it was a guy who was saying that, well, you have a very beautiful website, it's great, it looks good, you have online activity in these different websites, but it's still I'm not really convinced because I don't know who you are, where are you coming from. So these are the type of things that I was really dealing with. But uh, right now I'm, I'm doing a research sending survey out to planners, to urban planners who are working for the local government. Um, and I don't have that problem that much. So I think in some cases it can be a little bit more difficult like Facebook, which is which everything is very anonymous um, comparing to like sending an email directly to someone else and asking for a participation. Yeah, I think uh, a number of my projects, um, uh, well, the fashion district project, which I just gave you a kind of small snippet, uh, snippet sorry, tongue twister, <laughs> um, uh, which I just uh, showed you briefly. We actually had 100 fashion designers that we tracked <laughs> for two weeks and so we had to get, and I wanted designers that were from big firms, like we have Nanette Lepore in there, Diane Van Fossenberg, but I also wanted kind of Calvin Klein, then I wanted the kind of mid-level firms, and then I wanted the real startups. And we did like a Facebook's online promotion, we like went to blogs, and we, and we had lots of people who signed up, but ultimately the people who participated are the people that we went to their studios and talked to face to face. So I thought that was really interesting because at the end, I think we had like 200 people sign up and say they participated in the study. Our end became 100 and that was because those 100 people we actually talked to. So I thought that was uh, interesting and kind of, um, with the Nairobi project, I think there were a lot of cultural differences. Um, that was one of, I think they were all really excited about the project um, and because of their excitement to use phones, they were really excite excited to engage, but just kind of more um, uh, timing, uh, what is this, what is this kind of uh, uh, other kinds of larger strategic things that um, was different, but I actually found that the Nairobi um, community and the technology community is really enthusiastic about using data and technology, and so they were great. I hate to be skeptical, but I noticed that um, in your Facebook, everyone was a volunteer in life. And I just wonder, do you ever wonder how many people are lying um, when they're, <laughs> because, you know, 67% of the people volunteer and I don't, if we, how many of you, you know what I mean? How do you clarify and do you ever wonder, because I'm going to look good, even though I'm anonymous, I still want to say, let's see, in 1984, I actually did volunteer, so I think that qualifies. I'm a volunteer. So this one question is, how do you qualify when people are volunteering information that they're really being objective and not just trying to tell you what you want to hear? And then the second thing that occurred to me that is interesting is uh, I took a class years ago, and um, this guy would talk about the big mouse. And he said, you know, most of us hate big mouse. Um, but they're awesome because they're the person, if you want everyone to know, tell the big mouth uh, because they'll spread it. And I wonder if that's another technique, like in either of your studies, that you say, let's find the big mouths out there. They'll spread the word. Cause, so sometimes they're really useful people. I, I, sometimes they're not. Um, but I, I don't know if those are some of the techniques and just had those two thoughts. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So uh, regarding qualifying volunteer activity, uh, we ask a very specific question that during the last three years, if you have uh, worked as volunteer for three full days, which considered as three eight hours volunteer activity. I, I just didn't, 
sorry, didn't have all those details here, just to make it more simple, but uh, we had a very, very uh, clear question regarding that. Do you wanna go and talk? Um, I guess um, in my projects, um, I'm not asking questions that um, um, I guess need some kind of <laughs> a survey. I don't, I, I'm kind of collecting more data so is the data that I'm collecting real? Um, it's, it is real full of biases. Um, <laughs> and I think that's an important thing to remember when you look at things like the Foursquare output ha showed us a lot of different land uses, but you saw a lot of black on those maps or we're not seeing information. And, and the point is that um, I think you can use it to help describe a city that you don't know, um, but you're missing lots of pieces of it and you need to make sure I guess what I mean by that is the black is just as important as the colors in those maps because what you're not seeing is just as telling as what you are seeing. I'd say in both cases, um, you know, your, your discussion of the volunteer conversion rate. Right. So you had people that were willing to say yes online, but then you couldn't convert those people into action in the real world. Right. And so, you know, Nader, in your work, you know, the, the idea is that governments would be able to go in or our nonprofit organizations that are looking for volunteers be able to quickly identify who those influencers are, the big mouse or, you know, whatever it might be, and then try to activate them. The question is, what's the activation rate, you know, among these people? So you've already identified their influencers online, but how can you get them to take action in the real world, either going out and um, doing survey work or going out and helping with recovery or efforts or whatever that might be. So I think that's something that still remains to be uh, seen and maybe we need more help from sociologists and social workers and others to help us think about ways that we can take advantage of these communities and, and convert them into greater action. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think Ethan Zuckerman's work um, from the, the Center for Civic Media really talks about the, the big, big mouse on media, um, but there isn't a lot of how do you translate kind of those media big mouse into the, the real world and real action, um, except for the fact that those big mouse on di digital media do have an effect of bringing information to larger people and a per certain percentage of them are those types that would do, do things in the real world. So I think, I think it's about getting it out there, whether it's in digital media or, or um, it helps to get that message out there. And I also think that in this project, we were trying to see, uh, so how can we find these big mouses? But so let's, let's say, okay, we have find all of them or the majority of them, but are they really influential or do they have the basic qualifications to really work in our case for the disaster recovery processes or they are just making some buzz there and not doing anything real? I think it's it's fascinating to look at some of those big mouths. I have one in my own community, and um, I personally don't like her um, in real life. Um, I find her kind of annoying, but she is fabulous online. Okay, and so I uh, took the bus home um, and one day, and I got prepared to get off, and the bus didn't stop. So I got off at the next stop. I was like, that's really weird. He must have missed my bus stop, right? Just forgot that I pulled the the thing, and so I walked back home, and I realized my bus stop is gone that they took out the shelter and they took out the bus stop. And so I posted in our little community group and I said, hey, did anybody know what happened to the bus stop? That's kind of weird. You know, you don't really expect your bus stop to just be gone one day. And um, so this, my big mouth in my community, she um, got online, uh, went and called the public transit agency, had a whole conversation with them. And it turns out they had been taking out bus stops, but my bus stop wasn't on the list. And so it had been taken out by accident. Now, I don't know how that accidentally happens, right? Um, but then all the people in the community were like, woohoo, and they're, you know, then it caused this big fervor over how do you accidentally lose a bus stop, and, you know, but she was championed as this, uh, you know, as this fantastic person in our community who was go willing to go out, and while she was still online, she made the phone call, right? All I wanted to do was bitch about not having my bus stop anymore. I was not prepared to take action. I was willing to walk the extra two 
two blocks every day instead of just picking up the phone and finding out that my bus stop got lost. Now, I will tell you, my bus stop has nil, still not returned. So while she was my champion and called, it has not resulted in the uh, replacement of my bus stop yet. So there, there are limits to the success we can champion. Yeah. Sounds like urban sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll accidentally reappear. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if um, you are aware of uh, other projects, whether you yourselves participated or just are aware of them, in which kind of these visual visualization techniques were aimed specifically at mobilizing the public uh, in, a, in a political way. I mean, not just to mobilize them to take kind of direct action, but uh, to get them, to, to put it bluntly, to get them upset about something. You know, now that you see this map and where schools are located or where the potholes are, you know, we're, you know, let's have a flash mob at City Hall or something. Is just, I'm just looking for experiences that sort of connect the kind of data visualization to, um, you know, organized engagement of that kind. Right. Um, I think it happens all the time. I think. Uh, visualization is a strategy that we've used, um, God, since the beginning of time almost to make an argument for certain policies. And so I can think of, you know, everything from, you know, 1960s where we used maps to um, as evidence for removing all whole communities. Um, let's see, kind of more recent ones is using maps to figure out where the uh, next bike sharing program should go and kind of using that as an act activist. Uh, actually, if you look at New York, all the, there's, uh, there was a map recently that showed that all the bike shares are in very wealthy communities and that the low income communities do not get the bike share program. But actually when you look at the census data, uh, most people who ride their bikes to work are in those lower income communities. So that that was kind of an activist map to kind of get more bike sharing in those communities. I think Sopa Pita uh, movement, uh, which was about, what was that, like two years ago, which was a huge movement on, on, on the web, had a huge um, kind of uh, uh, Facebook force, kind of, uh, uh, kind of spread the word that way. Um, I think that using social media along with visualizations has become a strategy that's used not just by corporations but also by activists um, and employed um, very well using and kind of borrowing advertising techniques to do so. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers and please join me. Thank you. And we don't actually have a break. We're going to go right into our next session. It's our last session of the day, and of course we've uh, saved the very best for last. So Michael Batty is with us here from, uh, he chairs the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at University College London. He's a fellow of the British Academy and is the author of numerous books and articles on cities and complexity. And his new book just came out, what, a couple of weeks ago, um, called The New Science of Cities. And it's a really fantastic read that focuses on understanding cities as systems of flows. And so I'm sure he's going to be sharing with us some from his new book. So please join me in welcoming Michael Betty. Uh, th th thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about urban analytics and big data, and uh, indeed, as Jennifer has anticipated, and indeed the last, uh, our last two speakers uh, talked about uh, networks and flows, etc. Uh, and one of the key issues, I think, in terms of um, big data is uh, flow data, network data. So uh, I'm, I'm actually going to begin with this and show you some examples. Um, okay, if you actually want to uh, look at the PDF of this presentation, uh, then it's available on one of my blogs. The blog's quite easy, spatialcomplexity.info. Um, I was able, using uh, 
Peter Shane's account to actually post it onto my blog about uh, half an hour ago, so it's there. Uh, I was going to check it on my iPhone from down there, but I've actually hit the roaming limit, right? And it would probably cost me about £10 to download it on the, uh, on the iPhone. So if anyone wants to download it, you're, very, uh, uh, you're able to do that. If you go to spatialcomplexity.info, just loading it now, I think. Okay, so this is my blog coming up. Okay, so, uh, and if you go, if you just drill down a little bit, uh, then you can actually see big data, get my talk as a PDF. So that should come down. Uh, and I will show, in fact, a little bit later, uh, a couple of examples using the net. Um, okay, so let me begin by um, uh, showing you a couple of examples, and then I'll tell you what I'll do in the rest of the talk. But um, I'm going to begin with um, uh, a big data set, and this data set pertains to, uh, pertains to transport in London. Now, this is a map of the, uh, uh, the London Tube. This is the kind of classic, iconic, uh, 1930 um, Harry Beck map, as we call it, and many maps of tube systems around the world, uh, subway systems, are modeled on this kind of abstraction. In fact, I think Sarah's map, uh, to some extent, um, of routes in, in Nairobi uh, was, was similar. Now, uh, the, the big data itself, is, uh, which we have for the transport system in London, the public transport system, uh, is much bigger than the, the bit of the big data that I'm actually going to talk about. I'm really going to talk about just the tube system. And what you can see here is the tube. There are one or two lines uh, which are the overground railway, but a little bit later I'll show you the complexity of the whole system because the data that we have um, is the so-called Oyster Card data, and the Oyster Card data is produced uh, on the basis that um, uh, you have a, a, an RFID uh, stored value sort of card which you top up with money, and um, you tap in and you tap out, basically. So if you want to actually uh, use the tube, then you have to tap in and tap out. You can uh, buy an ordinary ticket still, but about 85% uh, of the tube travelers uh, traveling on the tube um, are actually using the Oyster card. Uh, now, there's some data here. So we, we tap in and tap out on train journeys, but we only tap in uh, on, uh, on buses in that sense. And that's a major problem, because what we're really interested in where people are going in some sense, if we only know they uh, tap in on the bus, basically, we don't know where they get out, then we have to do a lot of detective work with this data to say anything meaningful, meaningful about bus travel. Now, this is accepted at uh, the Oyster Card at 695 underground and uh, rail stations, uh, and on thousands of buses, there are about 9,000 routes are traversed in London per day. There's about 9,000 buses on the road, basically, in that sense. Now, we've got uh, a lot of this data at different... Trans it's, it's passive data. Uh, Transport for London, TFL, actually collect it um, over a period, uh, they collect it uh, and archive it passively. They don't use it for real-time control because it's demand data. This is, this is how the actual population are uh, actually moving in the city. Uh, and we are, in fact, and I'll show you later on, uh, thinking about trying to connect it to the tube train data, which is actually the tube, the actual trains itself running on the, on the set, so, which is the supply. Um, one of the data sets we've got, which is over the, uh, the Olympics last year, uh, two years ago nearly now, um, is uh, about 991 million Oyster Card tap-in and tap-outs. So that's a, almost a billion um, uh, Oyster Card tap-in, tap-outs, basically. And I should say at this particular point, on the tube system, so there are something like 7 million tap-in, tap-outs per day. So this really is big data. I mean, it comes as a flat file. Uh, all you get is where people tap in and tap out. There's, very, there's no uh, geodemographics apart from uh, the fact that um, uh, uh, there is some identification of the traveler uh, in the sense that uh, all of those over 60 uh, and uh, over, aged over 60 are, and live in London uh, are able to get as a bus pass. Everywhere in Britain, if you are over 60, you get a free bus pass, basically. That's sort of agreed thing for the last 20 years or so. In, in London, it's particularly valuable because you get this Oyster card. Uh, you can travel on the subway, uh, and it does save you. Um, it's no secret that I'm over 60, so I have a, a Freedom Pass, uh, my, my free Oyster card. It saves, it saves me probably about 30 or 40 pounds a week, which is quite substantial. Um, of course, um, uh, about 20%, 22% of the population are over 60 in Britain, uh, and it's going to be sort of 33% in about... Uh, 
uh, 15 years' time or so. Uh, and in some sense, this is the golden age. Those of us like us who have freedom passes, then we may lose them, in fact. I'll probably age at the point. They'll probably, they'll probably sort of move it to 65, 70, and so on. So I'm probably okay. But uh, those of you in the, the audience who go to London and... Uh, uh, want to get the oyster pass, probably you've got to be of a certain age because they're going to change the limit. Okay, so, so th this, this is the data. Now, what I want to do is to actually show you what we've been doing with the data because some very interesting issues about the data itself. This, I'm going to show you a movie. Uh, this is effectively um, taking the data and actually showing you a week's worth of, uh, of records. So you'll see a little counter uh, in the top right it's under, with CASA, which tells you uh, that was, uh, this snap was shaken, this screen dump was taken on Monday at 8.30, etc. If I click on this, then it'll load the movie, and I'll talk over it, because there's a number of points I want to make uh, in terms of this movie. So, okay, it's beginning now at this point. It's on Sunday. Saturdays and Sundays are rather dormant periods in terms of the tube. There's only about 3 million tap-in, tap-outs on Sundays, basically. But we're on Monday at this point. We're Monday uh, afternoon, and then you can see the peak hour at that point. We'll come into Tuesday at this point point, uh, and then you can actually see the, the morning peak at that point, uh, and then uh, the evening peak beginning, and then you'll see a little blip at the end of the day, if you actually watch it, a little bit at the end of the day, which gets bigger. So there are really three distinct periods on the London Tube. Uh, the morning peak, uh, the evening peak at that point, and then Wednesday at that particular, uh, we're on to Thursday now, the morning peak... Uh, and then the evening peak, and then this little blip at the end of the day in that sense. Okay, so it's like a blood flow map in this sense, and there's, no, there's every reason to think that we can think about cities in terms of biological systems in this sense, although one of the major features of this data is that everything is different. Every day on these segments, you have different people traveling, you have different numbers. So in a sense, there is incredible heterogeneity in this data set. Okay, there are some interesting features that uh, uh, my various, uh, the guys who can mine this data and get access to it, it takes sometimes up to 20 minutes to just run a query on it in a sense. They gave me uh, a piece of the data for no a November day in 2010. And I looked at just the activity in, in the subway stations, basically. And when I looked at it, um, we actually found out that there were 6.2 million people had tapped in and 5.4 million people had tapped out. There was a missing 0.8 million tap-ins. Now, that's the net amount, okay, because, of course, we're at, we, we, we don't know uh, why this was the case, the 0.8, because they, they closed the tube at 2.30 in the mornings, and they opened it up again about 5 o'clock. Uh, so, presumably, this 0.8 million people were not actually circulating around in, empty tra in, in trains, basically, and not getting off or anything. Um, and, of course, what, what the answer is in this context is that the porters leave the barriers open, okay? The barriers can be left open. So, the, the, the missing 20%, in a sense, who have not tapped in uh, or tapped out. We don't know whether they tapped in or tapped out. That missing difference is due to barriers being open. It could be greater than 20% because, of course, it's a net figure. We don't know uh, what, but the difference is about 20%. And, of course, the issue is on the tube system, it's a closed system. You tap in and tap out. Uh, if you have a regular Oyster card uh, and you don't tap out or tap in, basically, you get fined implicitly uh, in the sense that... Um, uh, that uh, they will charge you the, the biggest maximum journey across to Zone 6, even if you're in, in Zone 1. That can be, you know, a substantial uh, uh, increase on what you're going to pay for a trip. Uh, of course, the point is that uh, people like me with freedom passes, of course, because it's a, an unlimited pass, uh, and, we, and uh, you can actually... Um, uh, you, you actually don't need to tap in or tap out if the things are open. And some of the outer stations on the tube are where it's a kind of an honor system where you just have to, uh, to tap in in that way. And then, of course, people with season passes who have paid for a month, etc., uh, don't have to uh, tap in and tap out. They've paid their, their whack for the month, etc. So to some extent, this is a great data set. Billions of records, basically, in a sense, but there are holes in it, and they're to, due to human error in some sense. So that's the first point I'd like to make. The second point is that it's a, this is a, a, a remarkable data set in the sense that we can, it's very simple, but we can actually produce some very interesting things. I asked one of my guys to actually figure out, out of the 7 million tap, out, tap in and tap outs per day, um, how, how many of these tap in and tap outs pertain to the journey to work. 
Now, the journey to work was defined uh, in terms of a certain period of time be between when you uh, tapped in and tapped out, basically, uh, in the morning or in the evening, etc. So the definition was done that way. Um, then, for example, uh, we said that um, a journey to work, we think that you, you would be journeying to work if you tapped in and tapped out at the same two tube stations in the morning or in the evening. So that was the definition. Now, in this data set of 7 million tap-in, tap-outs a day, 7% pertain to the fact that the, uh, that the traveler was tapping in and tapping out at the same stations at the beginning and the end of the day, which was remarkable because we expected it to be something in the order of 30 or 40 percent. So only really 7 percent, and we don't know whether that could be called journey to work or not because we just know that they're, they're routinely tapping in and tapping out at the same stations. So only 7 percent, in a sense, are really related to that. So in terms of traffic planning, transport planning in some sense, this is highly problematic. Uh, in a sense, because we know there are many more people traveling on the tube who are clearly varying their behavior. If you look at me, for example, I, I live in the city of London and uh, work at University College, which is between the city and the West End. I always take the tube from uh, St. Paul's to Tottenham Court Road, and uh, to, because I have a free pass, I then take a bus two stops, very lazy. But uh, uh, and if I look at my own behavior, um, well, over the last, uh, I spent the last two weeks in, in Israel, and then uh, I went into work on Monday before I came here, so I did tap in and tap out at that point, so you've got one activity. If you looked at my behavior, although it's relatively routine when I'm in London, uh, in some senses I might not be classed as a journey to work in this sense. The other thing we looked at was um, uh, I asked the guys to do a query on how many people uh, we're using uh, freedom passes, okay, which is the, the, the classification of these cards is into two or three students, children, freedom passes, etc. Um, how many people were using freedom passes and, and where the variation was, thinking that there would be a very high variation in the suburbs? What we actually found out was that uh, the, the maximum station was indeed a suburban station. About 20% of the travelers over a period of a week were... Uh, using freedom passes on the west, on, on the extreme west uh, in this sense. Um, uh, but in fact, that the number using freedom passes overall in the data set is only about 8%. Yet, we know that 22% uh, of people are over 60. Uh, and it's difficult to figure out whether people simply haven't availed themselves of this free pass, etc., or whether or not people living in the suburbs who are over 60, etc., are using cars, etc., and never use them. So there's lots of interesting issues that really pertain to this. Okay, now that's my, that's my first example. Let me go on quickly to the second example. I'm just going to close that down. You've seen it enough by now. Um, uh, and this is the plainfinder.net. Now, I thought it might be rather inappropriate to actually show this at this particular point because of uh, what's happened in Malaysia and so on. But uh, what, what got me thinking was that I'd, I'd looked at this before, and this actually is taken at about 6 a.m. this morning, uh, and it's actually the distribution of planes in, uh, as you can see, sort of Europe and North America, etc. Uh, and when we drill down, there's not many planes flying around Columbus, Ohio, uh, at that point, um, but you can click on the planes and you can see where it is, etc. I was under the belief when I first came across this site uh, a couple of years ago that all of the planes were actually recorded all of the time, basically, in that sense, but because we know from this Malaysian Airlines uh, uh, disaster or problem at the moment that, uh, in a sense, this is not the case in a way. So, to some extent, again, this is a kind of an oblique way of thinking about big data in the sense that there is big data behind this, it's being collected, but it's probably not uniform in the way we would like it to be if we were interested in using this data for sort of airline planning, etc., and so on. Um, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting application. You get an application, you can actually get a 3D version, basically, etc., so it linked to Google Earth and so on, and then various applications to the phone, uh, plane finder 3D, etc. Um, my last example, before I actually then tell you what I'm going to talk about in this, this lecture, basically, or quickly talk about, um, really pertains to uh, the impact of big data. Um, we in our group, w big data sort of crept up on us in a way, because most of what we do in our group at uh, CASA, at Center for Advanced Space Analysis, tends to be simulation modeling, which is uh, dealing with little data to some extent, or rather things like census data and so on, uh, and data that is not really streamed in real time. Because one of the features about big data uh, is that it tends to be 
Uh, most big data tends to be streamed in real time. It gives you this temporal dimension, which to some extent in the kind of spatial world of cities is, uh, at least until uh, quite recently, has been very rare. Um, uh, it crept up on me. This is, a, this is a picture when you go to Terminal 5 at Heathrow. They've probably taken the signs down, but um, I first came across it driving along the, one of the uh, motorways, the freeways in Britain, seeing this sign, EM, EM Squared, which is a company uh, with big data on the highway, etc. And then, of course, uh, uh, a picture in, in, in Heathrow. And then, of course, I I looked at uh, Google Trends, basically, and it's a picture from Google Trends showing you uh, the rise of big data, uh, compared cloud computing with uh, Web 2 and then uh, big data. In this context, you can see big data, which is the red curve, uh, rising, and then um, I looked at it again uh, a little bit later. This is November 2012. Uh, and you can see these waves of interest in terms of big data. So the, the very fact we're having a conference in a sense like this uh, is, uh, is clearly uh, re reflected in this, this rise of, the, of, the, of big data. But of course, this is actually big data looking at big data because Google Trends itself um, is based on the idea of big data. It's based on the idea of searches, really, in a sense, uh, in this sense. So there's some interesting things going on. Um, so all of this really is kind of preamble, really, to what I want to talk about. I, just want, I want to quickly begin in a moment to talk about these changes. A number of people have said this in the meeting. Big data uh, is very much uh, shortening our attention span, certainly in terms of cities, uh, from really what's happening over the next five t uh, or 10 or 20 years, etc., really to the next five minutes uh, or the next five hours, etc. So to some extent, big data, because it's streamed in real time, is shortening these attention spans. Harvey talked, uh, interestingly, about the kind of dynamics of, uh, of space and cities the other day, uh, which really pertain to all of this. Um, the second issue that I want to address, and these are themes that run through the examples, is how do we build good models of city using big data? Because clearly we have to aggregate the data, and is the big data the right data? Um, going back to the Oyster Card data set, the transport data set for Greater London, um, it's not easy to see how we could use any of that data for the th things that we're very interested in terms of transport planning. We might be able to use it quite effectively for disruption planning, but that's not really been on the agenda of city planning particularly. It is on the agenda of urban operations research to a limited extent. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, the, the difficulty of extracting things like journey to work, etc., the difficulty of, of, of putting it into the frame uh, of our thinking of cities um, is really quite problematic in that sense. So that's another key issue that I really want to address. Okay, exemplars. I'm going to go back to the, uh, the Oyster Card data set in a moment and say that essentially what we've been doing with this data set is looking at these short-term issues of disruption, etc. And there are some very effective things in terms of exploratory data analysis that we can actually say in this context. This is really to some extent data-driven. It's hardly data-driven modeling. It's more data-driven exploration, re really, in a sense, exploration of the data set. But there are, are implied modeling uh, strategies in this. Then I want to look at some simpler systems. I want to look at the public bike system, for example. Uh, and in fact, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll drill down uh, to the web to the uh, Columbus system here uh, and actually show you, uh, show you what's happening because we have a, a website in, in CASA where one of the guys has actually got all the uh, effectively available bike schemes around the world. There's about 100, 150, something of that order. Uh, and uh, many of these bike schemes have data which is produced routinely because of the way, the, uh, the way you can access the uh, system through uh, credit cards and uh, uh, over the net, etc. Uh, and in that sense, all the data is available. And so we can actually look, and we will look, not only at the London scheme, but we'll look qu at the, uh, quickly at the Columbus scheme uh, to see how it's been doing over the last hour or so. Uh, and then I want to look at something slightly different, which is more to do with big models than uh, big data, although, um, again, big data enters this. And this is some long and short-term flooding in this sense, our single cities project. And then some big disruptions in infrastructure, which is short-term to some extent. One of the reasons why we have the, uh, the, the, the Transport for London data uh, on the Oyster Card data is because they were very interested, Transport for London, in looking at the impact of an additional million people coming to London during the Olympic Games. Everybody thought that the stations would clog 
uh, and congest, etc., and the whole system would grind to a halt, basically. Effectively, it adapted very well for a whole range of reasons that are still not very clear. Um, but nevertheless, the, this, this sort of data that we have uh, really gives us an insight into these sorts of impacts. And then lastly, I want to switch completely and show you a very different big data set, which is really the, uh, the street or road network for the entire UK, uh, as coded by our ordnance survey, but uh, also uh, um, a similar system is open street maps, et cetera, and show you uh, uh, the idea of um, how we can use a big data set to actually look at uh, regional differences in that sense. Uh, and then, um, uh, finally, some, uh, some synthesis. Okay, now I'm going to race through this very quickly. Um, I've said a number of these things. I've said that essentially... Um, we're in the business of thinking about the next five minutes or the next, uh, the next hour or the next five hours rather than the next uh, five to 50 years. This is the time frame in a sense. And that's changing to some extent the way we think about cities. It's changing the questions to some extent. And at, at the same time, it's also changing people's behavior because much of this big data is being used to some extent. So Transport for London, for example, have very good uh, uh, digital signage, etc. We have much more information on the system now uh, in terms of delays and disruption, and that in itself is changing behavior. On the public bike systems, for example, there are lots of applications that you can download everywhere to see what the state of the system is. And again, this is actually changing, cha changing the structure in that sense. Okay, so the, the other feature, of course, is the big data is probably as unreliable as small or little data in this sense, perhaps more so, and I'll tell you more about these problems as we actually go along. The other feature is, um, can we build good models of cities using big data? The time frame is focused, and one of the points... Uh, I think is important is that many of the theories about what happens in cities in the short term are not very well developed. We can see cities changing over time in terms of their development patterns, etc. But in terms of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, this is really a new world in some sense for those who are actually sit uh, thinking about cities in that sense. Uh, and so in some sense, big data is in the vanguard of probably new types of theories about cities, and it will change uh, our, our view of cities in that sense, and it'll probably change our, our focus on what's important in cities in this sense. Um, uh, Aiton Ada yesterday said that uh, there were really explanatory models which were, um, in some sense, rather different, where the emphasis was really on causality uh, and modeling in sense versus predictive models, which in some sense relate to big data. Now, I think in the city planning world, to some extent, explanatory and predictive are tied together in some senses, that sense. Uh, and I think the big challenge in terms of city planning is to think about how these big data, which is streamed in real time, uh, how we can build models which are close to that data, uh, and this, in a sense, is, is data-driven modeling, etc., and how we can actually mix uh, big data with little data, how we can integrate it, and so on. And, of course, one of the features is that big data or, or in the short term will become rather different when we get uh, the data in the long term. So, for example, 2 billion tap-in, tap-outs per year in, uh, in the London Tube. Um, it's been going for about five years, the... Uh, uh, the system in terms of the Oyster Card uh, tap-in, tap-out system. Uh, when it goes for 10 years, we'll have uh, 20 billion records, basically, in this particular context, and we begin for the first time to see secular trends in the data. So, to some extent, the big data revolution is probably going to lead to um, uh, thinking very differently about different time horizons in this particular context, and that, too, will change uh, the kind of things we're interested in in terms of cities. Okay, now I've said a lot of this, that uh, 7 million a day, roughly 50 million a week, roughly 1 billion for every half year, uh, half year. this is our, our data set, so 2 billion a year, 20 billion over 10 years. Of course, one of the features is that it could well be that the system will change. This data is not collected for us. It's not collected for me to actually show you it in this sense. It's collected simply to actually automate the system in terms of actually paying for it in a way. Uh, as yet, the people who collect the uh, Oyster Card data are not using it in real time. They're archiving it, 
and they're very interested in, in our kind of analysis of it because in some sense they don't have the capability uh, to use that. Whereas the API data on the tube trains and the buses, etc., where you know where a tube train and a bus is at any point in time, that is used in, in terms of real-time monitoring because if you're standing at a bus stop or a train station in, in London, uh, you can actually see that data, that API data being processed and coming up on the, uh, on the digital displays, telling you whether a train is late or whether a bus is late and so on. Okay, now I said earlier on that the network in London was very complicated. This is actually putting together a variety of networks because uh, the tube system is a subset of this. We also have overground rail and we have network rail and if we were to put the bus routes on top of this, this would be really complicated. I often wondered why uh, the London subway system uh, the map of it was so simple in comparison, say, with Tokyo. Well, of course, on, in Tokyo, they actually put all of the rail systems onto the map, in a sense, and that's what makes it complicated. I think, in fact, if we did this for any city uh, of, the, of the order of uh, 10, 12, uh, 15, 20 million, etc., and Greater London, although it's 7 million, is probably more like about uh, 15 million in its, uh, in its extent than, uh, than the 7 million. Any, any of these cities of that sort of size have this kind of complexity. So to some extent, um, I'm taking a subset of this, and to get a picture of the whole lot, uh, we need to extend it uh, uh, to look at the whole lot. Okay, here's some pictures of... Uh, these are tube stations with tap-in, tap-outs, basically... Uh, we did some analysis of this, and there's a paper in PLOS One about uh, three years ago uh, in that context. And here's something that came out the other day. Uh, the guy who's uh, responsible for this, Ed Manley, uh, in our group, um, has basically produced uh, a map that uh, they seem to be experts in the group to actually get maps into uh, popular newspapers, etc., and so on. So this is a map uh, that he produced last week of 50 million journeys. That's probably a week's worth of data in some sense, that's what he's saying, uh, and he's actually produced a map which actually shows you, it's a very pretty map in that sense, but shows you the kind of dominant sort of stations in that sense, and if, if you could actually read this, which you can't, uh, then what you would find is that uh, that accorded to a good deal of common sense. The real activity points in central London uh, tend to be the mainline stations where you have this juxtaposition of the tube uh, and the heavy rail, basically, in that sense. Uh, okay, now I mentioned a moment ago that there's this other data set, so there are several other data sets, which really re pertain to the supply of data in that sense. Now, these are the tubes, uh, the tube trains, which are, um, wh which are colored according to the, the normal line. If I actually do that, then uh, those are the tube trains running. It's not very useful, but it gives you an indication that uh, there, is an a there are APIs out there which enable to deliver us in real time there is a latency of about uh, three minutes, we reckon, from the time that we query the API to when we get it onto our computers. But, uh, but, so, but, but essentially, the, um, uh, this is actually over a, over a period of a day or so in this particular context. So this is the supply data. Uh, the, next, uh, the next one's a little bit better, but it shows you some of the problems. If you look at some of those trains, uh, then they're actually not on the line itself. Now, uh, the guy, Richard Milton, our research uh, uh, assistant who does this work, basically uh, can't quite explain to me why this is the case. <laughs> he, he says that it's not due to him. It's something to do with the, the API and the way it delivers it in this particular context. There's a train that's shot uh, uh, off the lines, basically. Uh, and as this goes round, there is a glitch at some point where the system had to be reset. So all of this sort of stuff is, um, you can see the glitch in a moment, it all slows down, that's right. So at, uh, at nine o'clock in the morning, there's some, sy some system failure in this particular context. Now, what we're really interested in in this context is connecting this supply data to the demand data, because really to get to grips with, um, to get to grips with, uh, uh, to get to grips with, how people actually get on trains, to really look at disruption, we need to know how many people are getting onto trains, because if a train stops in a station, uh, then there will be people on that train who've got on earlier who'll be disadvantaged, but then the tra train will begin after the delay and move, and more people will be getting on. So at any point in time, we really, really know, need to know where people got on their trains, etc., to get the level of disruption that takes place. The big problem is we have the tap-in, tap-out data where the passengers are, are, are coming into the, into the system. We have the trains data, etc. But to get from the tap-in, tap-out 
uh, to the actual platform is very problematic. This is a picture of Bank Station, basically, Bank which is above the Bank of England, where there's about three or four lines come together, uh, and it can actually take you about 15 minutes sometimes to walk from, uh, say, the central line, which is the red line here, uh, through to the, uh, the blue line here, which is the Docklands Light Railway. And then if you go through to Monument, you can go under the road to Monument, which is a different station, but you can go in that sense, then that's going to take you probably sort of, uh, that's probably going to take you 15 minutes, 10 minutes to the Docklands right, Railway. So that's quite problematic. Now imagine you get into the Tube Station uh, and you really don't have much, uh, you're, a you're a new traveller, you've not been there before. All of those people will be taking longer to get down to the platform. They may actually be getting lost a little bit, some of them at this point, uh, getting down to the platform than the people who are the seasoned travellers. So to some extent, this question of simply getting in and then down to the train is quite problematic. Having said that, um, the critical issue too is that uh, the flow map I showed you, the blood map of London, in London pulsing, etc., we had to make lots of assumptions about when somebody enters the system, they tap in, uh, and we know where they tap out because of the unique identifier. We, we then need to know what lines they've actually gone on, and there, there's much redundancy in this system. You can go different ways on different lines, you know, to get to the same place. There's equifinality in that sense. And that really relates to the whole question of cognition, shortest routes, all of this sort of stuff, uh, in a sense of matching demand to supply. So there are many problems in, in doing this, and indeed Transport for London, who control all these data sets basically, um, are really in the business of not having enough capability to do that, but nevertheless there are the genuine difficulties in a sense in doing it anyway. Let me just go back one bit and uh, uh, quickly go through these. I'm very conscious of time at this point. Um, uh, here, for example, is some data that we have from, from the buses, that uh, at any point in time we can query the API to uh, find out where all the buses are, uh, and this is the effect of a bus strike. On May the 22nd, 2012, um, uh, this is taken at 9 o'clock, this is the distribution of buses, and you can see that on the eastern side, um, of the, uh, uh, on the right side, basically, of, of London, uh, you can see the boundary there of London. On the right side, there's uh, a dearth of buses in comparison to the same time the following day, basically. And that was because the East London bus companies uh, actually went on strike that particular day, and you can see an immediate impact. Now, because we, we've got some data recently that the Tube was on strike for two days, uh, recently, so we're about to get some data from Transport for London uh, where we can actually really look at this as a kind of an experiment as what's actually happened. Uh, I'll show you some uh, data on disruption of this in a moment. Lots of things we've done with this, and I'm going to skirt over it very quickly. We can look at the network in this sense. We can close stations and look at the impact on the network, and then we can load the network with the demand data and look at it again. So uh, lots of graph theoretic measures that we've used on this between the centrality. Interestingly enough, if we close Liverpool Street, which is a mainline station, uh, the impact uh, on the surrounding lines is much less than if we close Green Park. People have not, probably never heard of Green Park, but it's a very strategic location where three lines come together within the circle line, within the circle line, which bounds the, uh, the extended CBD. Uh, and the, the West End, the East End, and so on. Uh, and in that context, that uh, there's much greater, you can see this bottom slide shows much greater impact. Red is uh, additional travelers, uh, which is spread around the circle line, and blue is the, uh, and black rather, is the, is the reduction of travelers. Okay, uh, we've done lots of things on this. That One of the interesting things is to look at these profiles in terms of the stations. Uh, so here, for example, we've got, uh, if you just look at the top, top, the top, the top right, uh, in a sense, uh, versus the top, the, the bottom, uh, the bottom left. The, bo the top right, in fact, is the Arsenal. That's Highbury Station, and in fact, the uh, the peaks are, in fact, travellers coming in to actually watch the game, basically, to watch Arsenal play, basically, at that point. Uh, and the, uh, the, there are a couple of uh, events in the midweek, basically, uh, and then the event on, 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 on the Saturday game. Uh, the bottom left, for example, is Bank Station, which is classically Bank of England. It's big banks territory down there. And basically, that's a very normal profile. The other two profiles really relate to nightlife, tourism, and so on. Of course, we're only inferring from our knowledge, our broader knowledge of the city uh, about what these activity uh, profiles actually give us in that sense. 
Okay, let me just uh, c conclude on this before I move quickly to bikes. Um, the, the, we've looked at uh, a major disruption uh, from the data uh, on the circle line that um, uh, this is the disruption. This line was actually closed for three hours uh, on the 19th of July in 2012, uh, and that's quite substantial, well, four hours, in fact, it, in, in that sense. Uh, and you can imagine this is over the peak hour to some extent, uh, and, uh, and the midday uh, uh, travel in that context. And there's really quite substantial disruption that 1.23 million uh, Oyster card holders were in the system at that point, and they reckon that, I'm sorry, there's probably more than that, but 1.2 million people were actually uh, disrupted in some sense, uh, in the sense that when we compared the typical average travel patterns from previous days and later days, in a sense, uh, as a kind of template, we could indicate that there were uh, that this number of, of, uh, of travellers were actually disrupted by having to shift station, uh, having to take an alternative route, having spent more time on the system than normally, and so on. And we could probably even figure out, because we know the charging, we've not done this, we could probably even figure out whether people were actually disadvantaged in terms of... Um, uh, having to pay more, in a sense, from their Oyster card in that sense. So it's a variety of things we can do. Um, here, for example, um, this, is the, uh, this is the disruption between uh, Olgate East and Edgware Road on the, uh, on the circle line, circle and district lines. Uh, and uh, the, we've, uh, you, I'll just go through these very quickly. These are actually increases and decreases of travellers. Uh, so there's increased travel time. These are the travellers who changed their origin. They simply, you know, the tube station was closed, basically, because the line was down at that point, so they changed their origins. Uh, these were destination changes uh, in this particular context, and these were complete switches to bus, basically, in a sense, uh, in, in a way, a partial switches to bus, uh, and so on, and the total proportion disrupted. Uh, and here are some statistics about uh, trying to break it down into the kind of sources of disruption uh, related to uh, individual travellers at these particular stations who use these stations normally. Okay, let me move quickly to the, the bike system. Uh, we have this worldwide case study from Ollie O'Brien, another RA in our group, about 100 cities, um, uh, and you'll see in a moment that uh, each docking station, most of you probably know what a docking station is for a bike, uh, the docking station is shown by a circle. Uh, blue means empty, purple is 50% full, and red is full. Uh, there are normally two graphs that Ollie shows on these things. The weekday, normally a Wednesday. Weekday uh, end, normally a Saturday in that sense. And there indeed is an animation of the, of the, of the bike schemes uh, in this sense. Now here's the, um, here's the data, uh, the site. I'll bring this up live in a moment. Um, and as you can see that, in fact, on this particular one, Columbus is not on because it's probably, it's probably taken... Columbus must have come on stream within the last year. Is that correct? Okay, so this was taken a year ago, but I will show, uh, show it live in a sense. This is the London scheme. You see that the red represents uh, full and the, uh, the blue empty, etc. And you can see in the London scheme this movement. Harvey showed uh, Joe Wood's uh, animation the other day. Uh, which was an excellent animation because it, it extracted the pattern from this, in a sense, from this sort of visualization. Okay, here's the bike scheme. Um, 5,000 bikes in London, been extended to about 8,000 bikes. It's been relatively successful, um, we think, um, although it's mainly people who can... Who, it's probably mainly yuppies who actually ride these bikes, basically, in a sense. It really is... Uh, not designed for poor people in any sense, uh, and it's debatable as to whether it's a sustainable, uh, because you know to get the actual demand and supply right in a sense, there are all these little trucks running around moving bikes all the time, uh, you know, uh, and um, so that's one issue. Uh, although they are using uh, electric trucks, I think. I mean, in that context, so the whole green thing is at issue. But more importantly, the um, the cost is an issue in some sense, that it's not at all clear uh, that, the, that it's a very cost-effective scheme. It's heavily subsidized. Uh, in the London scheme, there's about 19 million journeys to date, uh, and Harvey's uh, visualization the other day actually showed how Joe had taken uh, a, a, an average, like we did in our, uh, uh, our flow diagram a moment ago for the tube, uh, how he took that and, and used this kind of synthetic data set. So here, here's, the, here's the bike system again. 
Um, and this is simply drilling down. There's a variety of data, etc. cetera. Uh, there's lots of apps out there that tell you um, what the uh, uh, what the status of the of the system is, how many bikes there are in a dock at that point. So lots of apps done because all of this data is in the public domain. Uh, and then the, the, these are some extensions. But let me actually go to the um, uh, to the Columbus system at this point. So this was uh, this was about 6 a.m. this morning. It says 10:58 on it. That's largely because my computer is still on English time and they're five hours ahead. Uh, in this sense. Um, and here, for example, uh, is the Columbus scheme. And I'll bring it up live in a moment to show you. Uh, 30 docking stations. Um, I think from this, and I'm not an expert on this, I have to ask Ollie, but I think there are probably 434 spaces in the 30 docking stations and 216 bikes. So this, is a, this ratio of 50% is pretty typical, I think, to actually get the balance right in that sense. So the supply in terms of docking stations is about twice as much as the number of bikes in that sense. So let me actually um, let me bring up the, uh, the global thing in this sense. So this is his website bikes.obrien, so um, you can see it's uh, uh, 2040 in London, uh, so it's uh, 20 to 8, is that about right? Yeah, 20 to 5 here, 20 to 8. Doesn't look right. Oh, 40 after 8, okay, yeah, 20. Yeah, okay, I'm with you. Right, okay, so uh, the, there are 94 cities in the data set, um, nearly 10,000 docking stations, uh, something like 100,000 bikes, basically. So this is worldwide. If you click onto this, et cetera, so if we click onto the, one of the biggest schemes is, uh, is Paris, basically. Uh, so this is the Parisian scheme. So, uh, and if you click on one of these things, it tells you that, I don't know where that is, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, well, let me, actually, let me actually move back to uh, and actually click on Columbus at this point, which is this one. So it's a little, actually Columbus is probably more familiar to me than uh, Paris is in that sense. So, <laughs> <laughs> because there's thousands of docking stations in Paris. I didn't know where we were when we actually got down. Okay, so here's Columbus. Um, uh, not told me very much. It's, if, the, these numbers seem to be the same, etc. But if you can actually see the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the red is, um, is, is full and the blue, or fuller, I should say, uh, in terms of that, and the, uh, the, the, the blue is empty at that point. So if I click on, on this one here, which is, uh, uh, this gives me the activity, this graph of the activity. Uh, these are, this is over the last 24 hours, etc. cetera. Um, uh, again, um, if I want to produce an animation of this, uh, then um, over the last 24 hours or so, this will, this will simply show, uh, show the activity. And it's a relatively small scheme in that sense. It's not really showing very much at that point, uh, in a sense. Um, uh, to some extent, there are issues related to the visualization, although Ollie O'Brien is a very skillful web programmer, etc. There probably uh, could be an improvement in the visualization of this, in a sense. But nevertheless, it's a, a quite an impressive thing to think that uh, we can actually query the scheme and uh, all of this data is pulled into London to the server and then, you know, is back through here, etc. Uh, and again, in a sense, uh, the data is big, in a sense, because once we have the data over time, as we do, in a sense, then we are really talking about big data. Okay, let me move on very quickly uh, and... Um, quickly go through this Miami Beach, which is more interesting. We've done lots of stuff on this, um, and there are various uh, uh, Vimeos and uh, YouTubes of the, uh, of the flow system, etc. But the, the system is relatively simple, and in terms of the number of travelers, uh, it's relatively small. We're talking here about no more than 10,000 bikes in London, probably 8,000 bikes. Probably the maximum uh, usage is something in the order of... Uh, uh, not all 8,000 at one point in time, probably about four or 5,000, et cetera, uh, uh, in that sense. So consequently, and you can see that at uh, this particular point, there are only uh, 862 bikes uh, in use at that point in this particular video. So that was early in the morning um, in 2010. But of course, that was a while ago, and it's much more popular now. Okay, right. Let me quickly... Uh, uh, let me quickly uh, run through this and talk a little bit about long. In fact, I might actually, I might actually skip this and move to the last one. Um, we've done a lot of work on looking at impact of things using big data. And we have 
a number of big models looking at long-term flooding in this sense. Uh, and the visualizations really deal with, um, uh, we have a 3D model of London. And to some extent, this is still big data, although it's not quite big data in terms of streaming. What I'm doing is actually flooding central London at the moment. Uh, let me just stop that for a minute and bring it and uh, show it again. Okay, um, we pose the problem, what happens if the Greenland ice cap melts? And if the Greenland ice cap melts, then the North Sea is going to go up by about, and the, Atlant uh, uh, the, the North Sea is going up by about four meters. Uh, we reckon that f uh, one meter is the projected sea level rise by 2100. Um, basically, London is built uh, on, the northern, on the north bank, basically. This is the Tower of London down here. I'm pointing the mouse, basically. Uh, so this is simply a visualization of uh, what happens if we simply raise the, raise the Thames. So we're up to about a meter, and you can see bits of the south bank are flooding, basically, already. There are very good reasons, I think, to pitch the, uh, the Roman camp on the north bank, because the south bank was quite swampy at that point, but... The competing hypothesis is that the Romans themselves were going to march north. They didn't want to. They'd been down south. And by the time it gets to four meters, you can see most of South London, South Bank of London. And this is, uh, this is expensive territory in terms of house prices. I mean, uh, the, the Russian oligarchs have been flooded at that point. So, but anyway, uh, okay. We, now, now, again, it, this is big data. We've looked also... Uh, because we have, and, and this is very routine around the world now, because we have very good network data, very good street data, all digital, etc., we can pose the hypothesis, what would happen if we closed all the bridges, if all the bridges were flooded up until Hammersmith uh, along the Thames, uh, and, we re and this changed the orientation, you couldn't get across a bridge, how would the accessibility pattern change? How would the flow pattern change in that sense? So we're able to do that. That's a really very simple calculation to do in this sense. So there's lots of interesting impact analyses we can do with this digital data in that sense. Uh, this is big disruptions. I talked about disruptions, and I'll just illustrate this because this is an accessibility map uh, for the, uh, the London tube system, uh, red being high accessibility, accessibility being relative nearness to all of the places. And the blue bit in the middle is interesting because actually this is a composite map, I should say, uh, but you can see the, 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 li the lines to the south are um, relatively modest, uh, very few, few tube lines to the south. But this is an integrated accessibility map, and the blue bit in the middle is congestion charging. It's all turned into travel cost accessibility, and that bit is the congestion charging zone, uh, which would cost you about uh, $12 a day to actually cross it in a car. You'd have to pay it by 10 p.m. the uh, the evening of the day you're traveling at that point. So congestion charging, which uh, has reduced traffic in central London, uh, not many people are traveling by car anyway. In this area, which is about 7 million people, about 60% um, uh, travel by either walking, cycling, public transport, tube, bus, heavy rail, etc. 40% of people travel by, um, uh, by car, basically. Uh, and most of those people are traveling in the, outer in the outer suburbs in that sense. But congestion charging uh, applies to all vehicles, not just cars. Uh, uh, so to some extent, that has actually reduced the accessibility. We've looked at the impact of, of, of we're particularly interested in the impact of the Olympic Games. Uh, we're very interested in the Im impact of this new high-speed rail from Maidenhead in, in, the west, in, in the west to Stratford. Um, think back to the picture... Let me go all the way back to uh, I can go all the way back to the uh, the tube map here. Oops, gotta go way back. I'm not, oh, there, there we are. That's the map. Um, no, go back to that. Think about putting in a high-speed railway across this network and look at the impacts. Um, in other words, from 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 west to east, from left to right, in a sense, across that, and, and it'll be connected at various points with it be one train every minute, they reckon, running between, you know, somewhere like Heathrow and somewhere like uh, Stratford, connecting up these main line stations. So that's a, an enormous impact, and to some extent, the complexity of it is, can only really be handled by the kind of data sets that we're now beginning to get available, uh, and by the kind of network analysis that all of that really pertains to. Okay, let me go back very quickly to... Uh, 
uh, to where I was and look at the last aspect of what I was talking about, which is looking at regional uh, data in some senses. Okay, right. Um, we have a project in CASA, and I'll finish within about five minutes now. We have a project in CASA which is really related to defining cities in Britain. And to cut a long story short, we're interested in doing this because there are various ideas about cities at the moment that suggest that as cities get bigger, they get richer more than proportionately. This has been, de it, I mean, it's as old as the hills, really. Alfred Marshall said it in the 19th century, urban agglomeration economies, basically. So if you live in New York, your per capita income uh, is going to be sort of 15% higher than if you live in somewhere like uh, Columbus, or at least that is the assumption. That's nothing to do with the cost of living, but in other words, these agglomeration economies. Now, we've been testing this in the UK, but we're particularly taxed by the idea of defining what a city is. And to cut a long story short, what we've done is to actually look at clusters of cities, and we've looked at clusters of cities as being defined by relative distances between street intersections. So the whole of the UK um, is actually uh, networked in some sense. Uh, and this, for example, uh, is a picture to some extent of the network. And what we're seeing here uh, is effectively we're, 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 we have a database of all of these street intersections. There are literally uh, millions of these street intersections that have been coded, etc. And we ask the question, uh, how connected are all these street intersections to each other in terms of distances? And what we're seeing here is the cluster, uh, or the clusters, I should say, uh, which are separate from one another, uh, which are something like five kilometers. So, for example, these Scottish islands are more than five kilometers from the mainland. So in that sense, that they're in a different cluster. And what we're interested in is gradually reducing the threshold of distance, in a sense, as we go down. So we're, we're, we're reducing the threshold of distance. This is a bit, a bit like, say, we're plotting the clusters, what's connected to each other, as we actually decrease these distances between. So that we really want to end up with the clusters that are the most highly compact and dense. But in the process of doing that, uh, then we're actually sort of taking it from the top down, in a sense. Now, this is particularly interesting, because what actually happens at that point, Scotland becomes disconnected from England and Wales, in that sense. And that's very interesting, because, of course, in September, there is the referendum, uh, when the Scots will be asked if they want to uh, uh, leave the uh, United Kingdom, and uh, already there are all sorts of uh, moves about uh, the big argument at the moment is that uh, the English and the Welsh, i.e. the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, say that Scotland cannot keep the pound if they leave the Union, basically, uh, whereas uh, the Independent Party, the National Party in Scotland, say that they want to keep the pound. Well, of course, the pound is, is more controlled by England and Wales than it is by Scotland in that sense. So, nevertheless, but this is very interesting because, in a sense, what it's suggesting is that the evolution of Scotland, to some extent, in terms of the road system, uh, is really somewhat separated. This, this line between Scotland and the rest of England and Wales, etc., uh, is really the Scottish lowlands, which has not developed to the same extent as other parts of the UK. And probably you can trace this back to the fact that um, it's a, a long-time historical phenomenon that Scotland um, basically only joined the Union in 1606 at the end of uh, Queen Elizabeth I, who had no children, basically, the Scottish King, James VI, came to the throne, he was James I. Why we had our civil war, etc., in the following uh, 50 years or so was largely because the Scots were Catholic and the uh, English and Welsh were uh, Protestant at that point, basically. Um, so in some senses, uh, this is an interesting kind of oblique way of thinking about things. Anyway, let's uh, keep the... Uh, 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 keep, keep the things going down. At this particular point, the southeast, which is the rich bit of Britain, disconnects completely uh, from the rest of uh, uh, from, from the rest of um, uh, of England and Wales in this particular context. And this is very significant too, in some senses, particularly in terms of the economy. We're interested in getting the clusters, which are really the cities in a sense. And we've really got to get down. We're getting to the point there where these really are the cities that. Uh, uh, London at the bottom, and then Manchester, Liverpool. Uh, and we've, we've, we've come to the conclusion that it's at this point, whoops, at this point, 
uh, that probably this is the best definition of cities. If we reduce this down to less than 200 metres, uh, which is roughly the width of the Thames, etc., uh, then basically you can see that London actually divides into north and south at that particular point, so that's not effective. So we're using this kind of thinking uh, with, in terms of big data to think about defining these questions about how big cities are. Of course, this is only one out of many ways of thinking about these cities. Okay, now, let me just um, uh, attempt to synthesis and just pull a few things together before I stop. Um, my basic point, I think, here is that big data is changing our focus. It's changing the way we think about cities, uh, and at the same time, and this is to some extent uh, 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 beyond what I've been talking about, but to some extent it's also changing how we behave in cities. So big data and computers are changing uh, what we're interested in cities, in this sense, what's important perhaps, and it's also changing people's behavior. So we have this kind of moving target. If you think back to the, uh, the animation right at the beginning, then of course um, really the kind of theories we have in the physical sciences, in biology and physics and so on, are really in many senses highly inadequate when we turn to human systems because uh, the, the, the blood flow diagram of London, etc., the big difference between blood flow in ourselves or in animals, etc., and blood flow in cities is that, you know, the blood is different all over the city in that sense, whereas in terms of the animal populations, the human populations, it's the same. So to some extent, this, this portrays the complexity of the thing we're dealing with. So that's the first point. The second issue is that we might shift too radically in terms of big data. It gives us the opportunity to look at these more focused tools, uh, in a sense, but uh, big data is really short data in the sense that uh, it's concerned with the immediate. I think it was Brian, um, Brian Cameron, I think, who said that uh, big data is really uh, focused on current issues in some sense, uh, and this is particularly resonant in terms of cities. But as we accumulate it, as long as the systems don't change, and there's no guarantee that that... Uh, that the data will be continuous in this sense, then it will become long data, big long data, and we'll be able to look at many time horizons. That's a very important thing, I think. Um, and this does enrich our ability to understand when we have data uh, over this particular context. Uh, we also need to uh, think about new theories in this sense. Um, and we have to be wary about the quality, etc. And we have to also think, and this echoes the last talks, uh, we also have to think about little data and small data in that sense because big data um, is just another perspective, really, uh, on the systems that we're dealing with. Okay, now I'm not going to talk about that, um, uh, but I just want to thank the various people in my group who've done all of these things. Ollie for his bikes, Ed Manley for the Oyster Card, John Reeds, who is a assistant professor now at King's, basically, who did the original visualization. Uh, Richard Milton, who's done all the stuff on tube work, Andy and um, uh, Steve Evans, who did 3D visualizations. Tyndall Cities for the stuff, and then our group doing the uh, allometry and percolation work, which is the last thing I actually showed. Okay, so there's my coordinates again. If you want the PDF, which is a little bit fuller than the actual lecture because I missed some bits out, uh, then it is available at that, uh, at that website. Thank you. We could take a couple of minutes for a question or two if uh, sure. the mic is up to it. And yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, great talk as usual, Mike. Um, but you mentioned that big data is short data, but in tradition of urban modeling, we focus mostly on the long term. So how is it we bring long-term modeling, our tradition in urban science, together with uh, the short-term data in order to get maybe perhaps a multi-scale depiction of the city, a fuller well, depiction? Well, I mean, I, I was saying that, uh, I, I, what I was saying was that uh, the big data I was talking about largely is data which is streamed in real time. So it constantly introduces this time dimension, uh, which uh, in a city context has, I mean, space has always been more richer than time in some sense. Hmm. So consequently, in terms of cities, we've thought about um, how cities change over relatively long time periods. Now, this data does not inform us yet about any of those things, but it will do, it will do 
as long as we keep collecting it, in a sense. You know, in 10 or 15 years' time, some of these big data sets, if they've been collected, will actually portray a richness that we can't have at the moment because we can't see secular trends in them. That, that, notwithstanding the fact that the data itself is problematic in terms of our theories, it's not addressing the same sorts of questions. Many people in this meeting have said big data is unstructured. And that's, a, that's a one of the key things. That a lot of the data we've dealt with in urban models, etc., is essentially very right. focused data. It's from the census, mm -hmm. which is highly structured in terms of asking people questions. Not necessarily completely structured to the way we would like it in terms of our models, but nevertheless closer to the models that we've built in the past uh, than, the, than the new big data. Right. I think there'll be a filling in, and we'll see, we'll see that uh, we'll see much greater scrutiny about different types of big data, uh, some of which will be useful for certain sorts of things, others useful for it, and, and much of it may be not useful at all. I mean, that's the, that's the key thing. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the, that we really just stand at the beginning of all this in terms of how we deal with it in terms of our theories and models of cities and how we devise new theories and models that deal with these much shortened timescales. Thanks. So I found all your examples really interesting, the Easter cards, the bike sharing, so forth. And one of the things I've been thinking about with big data um, is how do we get some of the analysis strategies into government, right? And so that the types of research that you're doing then can translate into kind of policy form, policy change. So I thought I just wanted to know um, how uh, Transport of London yeah. has reacted to some of these projects as well as the bike sharing uh, projects. Okay. That that's, that's a very good question. Um, the, the, the critical issue is Transport for London are quite, a, are quite a, uh, an advanced sort of agency. They have uh, the London traffic model um, is uh, routinely run you know, to do the sort of things that big cities do with traffic, etc. Uh, there are various models for different systems that they have. One of the things that they don't have is the capability to stand back a bit and use some of the data resources uh, that they've, um, they're now acquiring and have ownership of. Um, uh, in other words, it's a capacity issue. It's not necessarily even a technical issue because some pretty smart people. It's a capacity issue uh, and to some extent that this puts a slightly different, uh, it might be slightly different from here, that uh, really for the last 25, 30 years in Britain, uh, many functions of local government and trans including transport agencies like Transport London, have been privatized. So, for example, the London traffic model is run by Martin Voorhees, which uh, is the, I don't know what to call now, but anyway, the, the traffic consultancy that originally developed it. Um, Oyster Card Development, who we deal with in Transport for London, don't really have the capability to do much with the data that they're providing us with although uh, it's simply a manpower problem at that level. So in some respects, um, that gives us a, a role of, uh, which we've not had much of in the UK, uh, of university groups being integrated in, in a, a more appropriate way with, with, with government in that sense. Um, in terms of what one can do with the kind of thing that Transport for London have got, the bikes, bikes data and so on, they control that, um, uh, then in some senses they, they, they need to work hand in hand, I think, with many different groups of people to actually, uh, to, to actually handle that data. And, and uh, it'd be no surprise to you that uh, uh, they haven't got any money, basically, in a sense. So consequently, the data we've got um, uh, is given to us under relatively uh, modest restrictions. I mean, it, this is data that is... Uh, that really does not have major confidentiality issues, although I guess if you stood outside a, a tube station and uh, watched somebody come in routinely, you might be able to tie it up to the data. You might be able to tie it up to the data. That's true of many data sets. But, um, so I guess the answer to your question is that, yes, the, the, these agencies are interested in, um, in, in using this sort of expertise and developing it along with ourselves, in a sense. Uh, but it's early days yet. I mean, there's, there's been... Um, uh, I, uh, my suspicion is here in municipal government there is probably a stronger 
sense of, um, of how one might be involved in this sort of thing than, than, than in the UK. And that's due to the fact there's been this, uh, traditionally in the UK, uh, government has not funded research, in a sense, in any context. That if you look, at, whereas here, federal government has certainly funded research, etc. Um, so this is a learning experience, I think, in our particular context. And the bigger the authority, Greater London is a big authority, it's the biggest in the UK, um, they tend to have greater capability anyway. If you turn to smaller towns, uh, then there's, there's much less possibility of doing anything like this. I just want to thank Mike again for giving us, uh, and I don't mean this as a pun, um, such a graphic demonstration of the capacity of big data to advance understanding uh, to wind up this conference. Um, I, I do want to th thank everyone. Uh, John F. Kennedy reportedly told his cabinet uh, the first time they dined together in the White House dining room that it was the most impressive assemblage of minds in that dining room since Thomas Jefferson had eaten there alone. And uh, I'd like to say Thomas Jefferson has never eaten here, so I, I, I might advance a yet more ambitious claim for the collection of minds that uh, has gathered together for the last two plus days to discuss this. Thank you for making this such a rich conference. I want to thank the organizers, uh, my, my colleagues who uh, you saw as moderators of the various panels, uh, the student volunteers, and, and the speakers and the audience for sticking with us. Uh, and the final exam will be given shortly. Thank you so much.